All righty. Good morning. Algebra 2 CP A6. This is April 2nd. Uh, this is Thursday, I believe. Oh, it's been Thursday all day, right? Okay. Uh, so today, what I'd like to do with you is I'd like to just finish up our discussion on applications of radical equations. Just a couple of reminders before we get started. Please make sure, if you haven't done so already, to mute your microphones and disable your webcams. Also, make sure you fill out that attendance form on Classroom. In preparation for today's class, I asked you to complete uh, the first five problems on that word problems document. For the first five problems, I'd like to go over a couple of them, namely problems number three and five, because I think those are great examples of problems that you can expect to see on an assessment and problems that really encapsulate all that we've been talking about so far. Okay, so that's what I'd like to do with you. Um, after that, I'll show you a couple more word problems. And if we have time at the very, very end, I will show you just another solving equation example because I think it's always good to go back and review our good old solving equations. All right. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, starting with problem number three. Okay. Problem number three. Oh, I got to make sure my camera is properly focused here. There we go. Uh, so starting with problem number three on the homework assignment. Problem number three said the following two points are given x comma negative seven and negative five comma negative eight. Okay. It also told us that the distance between those two points was the square root of 10 units. And we were tasked with figuring out what missing x coordinates can satisfy that equation. All right. Recall from geometry that we have to use our good old friend, the distance formula. You are not going to be required to memorize the distance formula if you ever need it. Anything like that, a physics formula, distance formula, Pythagorean theorem, even though you should probably know that one, um, they are going to be provided to you. It's not your job to actually memorize that stuff. Okay? So I'd say that the distance is equal to, you may remember from geometry, x sub 2 minus x sub 1 squared plus y sub 2 minus y sub 1 squared. On the actual homework assignment, it is written in reverse, by the way. It's written as y sub 2 minus y sub 1 squared plus x sub 2 minus x sub 1 squared. But it really doesn't matter what order you write it in because you can add in any order, right? Addition is commutative, meaning you can go back and forth. So it's really the same thing. As long as you don't crisscross your x's and y's, everything should still work out for you. Okay? I'll work with that. So uh, let's go ahead and actually just plug in what we know and solve for what we don't. I'm going to call this x sub 1, this y sub 1. I'm going to call this x sub 2. I'm going to call this y sub 2. All right. My distance, the square root of 10, is equal to the square root of x sub 2 minus x sub 1. So we got negative 5 minus x squared plus uh, y sub 2, negative 8, minus y sub 1, so minus negative 7 squared. Okay. I can then go forward from there and notice this big big huge honking radical we don't like that big giant radical it's just like in the way of literally everything so we're going to go ahead and square both sides just to get rid of it right away on the left side hopefully you see why i wasn't really freaking out or concerned with that square root of 10 being the distance because once we square it it just becomes a regular old 10. so we can say now that 10 is equal to negative 5 minus x squared which we're going to go have we're going to have to distribute with that in a little bit plus here i have negative eight minus negative seven so negative eight plus seven is negative one and negative one squared is going to be positive one so plus one all right does everybody see how i got to that step all right now i can go forward from here i can distribute this piece right here. That's really what your algebra two instinct should probably be saying at this point too. Like if you looked at that, you'd probably be like, oh, I need to distribute to go forward, right? To get what X equals. So we get 10 is equal to negative five minus X times itself, because that's what it means to square something. Okay. I can now distribute first outer inner last. That's going to be negative five times negative five is positive 25. Negative five times negative X is positive five X. Here we have another positive five X. And lastly, the opposite of x times the opposite of x is positive x squared, and then plus 1. Okay? Now, we see that x squared show up. That should be an immediate indication that I need to factor, right? Immediately. Got to factor. 
But before we factor, we of course have to set our equation equal to zero. So I'm going to do exactly that by subtracting 10 from both sides and just combine all the like terms here. I'm going to get zero is equal to x squared plus 10x, that's 5x plus 5x. And now look at the constants. I have 25 plus 1 is 26. Then we subtracted 10, so plus 16. Okay. We can now go ahead and factor that into two binomials. We need x and x in order to make x squared. Since everything's positive, it makes sense to have plus signs everywhere. And now I'm looking for what possible factors of 16 can somehow combine to get me this 10x right here. And that's going to be 8 and 2. And so that gives me two potential solutions, one of x equals negative 8 and one of x equals negative 2. I actually got in a little bit of a bad habit there. I just said two potential solutions. Not the case in an application. In an application, we're guaranteed that those solutions actually will work out. So keep in mind, you do not have to check for extraneous solutions in these applications. Okay. Any other questions, concerns about that? Okay. We're all good with that. All right, fantastic. Um, so these two possibilities represent the possible values for x that can, that can work here, right? We can go ahead and plug in negative 8, and we should see that this checks out. If we plug in negative 2, we should see that this checks out. What that just represents geometrically is, again, the fact that from this point, you could draw a line in this direction, or you could draw a line in this direction, and both of which would have a distance of the square root of 10 units. Okay, so that's why there is two possible solutions. Going forward from there, let's jump into something like number five. So not every problem is going to be this like revisit of something from geometry. You may also see some random physics formula start to show up every now and again. Uh, that random physics formula is like problem number five something from meteor, uh, meteorology, good old uh, weather forecasting. Um, you don't need to know the background of that in order to be able to solve a problem like this. We're not concerned with the actual derivation of the formula, where it comes from. We're concerned with how do we actually use it to algebraically solve for what we need to find. All right, so just because you see a problem like number five and it's like this formula you probably have never seen before, it doesn't mean that I'm asking you to know about that formula and where that formula comes from. You should just be able to algebraically use that formula to get some answers, all right? Number five says, in a thunderstorm, the wind velocity V of P in meters per second is described by the function V of P is equal to 5.7 times the square root of 998 minus P, where P represents the air pressure in millibars. What is the air pressure of a thunderstorm in which the wind's velocity is 49.3 meters per second? And then round your answer to the nearest tenth. All right. So all we have to do is just plug in our 49.3 and solve for this P. So we know that the wind velocity is 49.3 meters per second. And we're going to set that equal to 5.7 times the square root of 998 minus P. Going forward from there, I'm going to just try to isolate this radical, just like we saw before. I'm going to divide both sides by 5.7, because before I square things, it would be nice to get those constants out of the way. Let's refer to our handy-dandy calculator here. I'm going to do 49.3 divided by 5.7. We got 8.65. Call it 8.65 is equal to the square root of 998 minus p. Okay. I can now go ahead and square both sides. All right. Because we want to get rid of that radical, we want to get to that value of p. On the right, the square root and square cancel out. On the left, 8.65 squared. We got 8.65 squared is equal to 74.82 approximately. And that's now equal to 998 minus p. Now we're really in algebra one land, even though we're dealing with some decimals, I'm just going to go ahead and subtract 998 from both sides. I get negative 923.18, if my mental math is correct, 
uh, is equal to the opposite of P. And think about it. If the opposite of P is equal to negative 923.18, then regular old P should equal positive 923.2. Oh, sorry. Yeah, because we have to round to the nearest tenth, right? Millibars. Okay. Right. If you answered 923.18, that's totally fine too. But the problem does ask us to round to the nearest tenth, and so we get an answer of 923.2. Any questions, comments, or concerns about that problem in particular? We're all feeling good with that? All doing great? Hopefully. Yes? Sinking in. Making sense. I take your silence as yes. Sounds great. Sean, thank you. He says, yes. Sounds great, Sean. I appreciate that. Maddie, you have a question about number four. What do you got? What do you got? Number four. Do you want me, do you want me to do it out? I could, I'm happy to do it out if you want me to just do it. Uh, no, I just looked at the um, answer key. Hold on. Let me sure. find it again. Sure. Oh. Sorry, one second. That's loading. fine. No problem. Okay, it won't load, but I think on the answer key you had like, like it as a, like you didn't do pi out, like you sure. didn't multiply it, you know? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I used like 3.14 yeah. and got like an actual answer. Will that still be right? Yeah, that's totally fine. So for okay, number four sure. on the answer key, you may notice I left it as 125 over 3 pi. If you make pi equal to 3.14 and then just multiply it out, you'll get a, a, also an equivalent answer. Okay, because I think I modified the instructions to say approximate pi to 3.14, and I did. Okay, does that clear that up? Yes, thank you. All right, cool, no problem. All right, uh, let's go on to a couple others. Um, just like I said, there's all sorts of formulas, some rooted in like the math courses you've talked about, like geometry, some just rooted in physics or other things, but they all use radicals, and they're all... Uh, they all kind of fall under this umbrella of applications of radical equations. So I want to give you another one right now, just show you one that comes from physics. I don't know if you've talked about this in physics, but again, it's not really relevant whether or not you have. Um, but if you haven't, then you're going to see some a pretty cool formula. I think you do this, though, in physics. You get that the velocity an object travels is equal to the square root of 2 times its kinetic energy, which is represented by E sub K, over its mass. I don't know if that's a formula you're familiar with, but that is a great for, uh, formula for physics that relates to kinetic energy, mass, and velocity. All right. So let's consider a problem like this. If I gave you that formula and told you an object with a mass of 100 kilograms is traveling at a rate of 30 meters per second. And then I ask you to find the object's kinetic energy. Again, the actual physics background is not necessary to solve this. You just need the algebraic processes. So what I would do is I would go ahead and just plug in what I know and solve for what I don't. I'm going to plug in my mass of 100 kilograms. I'm going to plug in my rate of 30 meters per second, and I'm going to try to find what that kinetic energy is. So that gives me an equation now that looks like 30 is equal to the square root of 2 times the kinetic energy, E sub K, which I don't know, over 100. First things first, I'd want to get rid of this big old square root because it's just in the way of everything. So let's square both sides. gives me 900 is equal to 2 times e sub k over 100. A common mistake that I want to point out that I didn't mention in my A1 class, I wish I did, is that a lot of students right away will make the mistake of multiplying both sides by 100 instead of squaring first. Keep in mind that this over 100 is still contained under that square root. So before we can even access anything under that square root, we need to square in order to eliminate that big old square root. Just get it out of the way. All right. Now that I have this, though, again, we're back in Algebra 1 territory. I would multiply both sides by 100. That gives me 90,000 
is equal to 2 times the kinetic energy, E sub K. Dividing both sides by 2, you would get that your kinetic energy is 45,000. Okay? I think kinetic energy is measured in joules, if anyone wants to correct me on that. But in any case, that's the idea. I think it's joules. Okay. Cool. Are we happy with that? Does that make sense? Good. Let me give you one more. This one is actually rooted back in good old geometry. Okay. Uh, it is Jules. All right, Miss Mal, you are coming to the rescue. I appreciate that. It's Jules. Uh, so consider something like this, another good old geometry example, right? Oh, yeah. You might remember something like this. If I have this, if I have this, if I have this, you may remember a good old example of how to find missing sides or angles of a right triangle. It's our good old friend, the Pythagorean theorem. So you may remember the formula of a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. The sum of the two legs of a right triangle squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared, right? a squared being one of the legs plus b squared being one of the legs is equal to c squared, the hypotenuse squared right? A manipulated version of this formula may actually look like this. Like to actually get C directly, you could square root both sides, right? And you would get that the square root of A squared plus B squared is equal to C, right? That makes sense. If this stuff is equal to C squared, then the square root of that left side should equal C. Don't tell math people this. I think it's going to ruffle a lot of feathers. But I actually think that this formula is a more useful version of the Pythagorean theorem. A lot of mathematicians will get all uppity if you try to say that. But I'm just saying, and I know it's recorded. Uh, but this formula, I think, is actually even more useful than your regular a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Because this just gives you c directly. Like if you plug in a and b, put that in your calculator, bam, you got c. All right? Uh, so don't tell people I said that. Uh, keep that on the DL. But we can actually use this manipulated formula because, it, of course, it has a big old honking square root in it. We can apply that to our applications of radicals. Consider a problem like this. The hypotenuse of a right triangle is 30 centimeters. If one of its legs measures 18 centimeters find the length of the other leg okay so consider something like that, where we have the hypotenuse of right triangle is 30 centimeters. If one of its legs is 18, find the length of the other. Using this formula down here, we can say, well, my hypotenuse is 30. And that's equal to the square root of 18 squared plus b squared. I don't know what that other leg is, right? That's saying essentially this is 30, this is 18. And I don't know what this is, OK? But we can use our good old knowledge of radical equations to figure it out. I can square both sides because squaring both sides will eliminate the square root. That gives me 900 is equal to 18 squared, by the way, is 324 plus b squared. Once again, we're back in Algebra 1 territory. Subtract 324 from both sides. I get 576 is equal to b squared. And when we take the square root of both sides, really understanding that only the positive result makes sense. So I would just do the square root of 576, and I get 24. So b would be 24 centimeters. Excellent. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have a question on that at all? Happy with that? So these are just two other examples of, of square root functions. All right, fantastic. Fantastic, yes. Feeling good, doing good. All right, great. Uh, so that being said, what I want to do since we have just about five minutes left is I want to just make sure I show you another example of an equation. I think it never hurts to see more equations being solved. So I'll give you another example of a solving equation where you have to do a little bit of distribution and checking for extraneous solutions. And then after that, we'll be just about done for the day. Okay. 
Uh, if you have not seen yet on Classroom, uh, the assignment that is expected for next class, which the next time we see each other, by the way, is April 7th. Uh, I do expect that you have the rest of those word problems on that document done. So that's now problems 6 through 10. Okay, so please make sure you get those done in preparation for next class. Next class, we are going to uh, review pretty much everything we've talked about as far as distance learning has gone. So I'll do some solving equations with you, and I'll do maybe a word problem or two with you. At the end of that class, I'm going to assign a progress assessment. That progress assessment will be due at the start of the following class, which is on April 13th. Uh, the faster you get it done, the faster I can grade it and give you feedback. And then after that, on April 15th, is when we are going to have our summative assessment. I already talked about what that would look like at the beginning of the class. And I sent you that long, long email. Again, I apologize for it being so long with all those details. But if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out. All right, don't hesitate to do that. And if you have any feedback, I want to hear that now. Like, feel free to say, Mr. Giorgio, I think that's a terrible idea. I'd much rather hear that now than hear it the day before the assessment. And now all of a sudden, like, there's a problem. So please make sure you tell me that. All right, so let's go ahead and just do one more equation to wrap things up. I use a regular piece of white paper this time. All right, uh, consider a problem like this, ready? Just a standard solving equation. We don't want to forget how to do those. And it's, again, always good to see another example. How about x is equal to 7 plus the square root of 39 minus 3x? If I wanted to just solve any sort of problem like that for x, some classic solve for x algebra, I want to subtract x from uh, subtract 7 rather from both sides so I can isolate that radical. That would give me x minus 7 is equal to the square root of 39 minus 3x. I would now square both sides because that radical is isolated. I want to get rid of that big square root symbol. I square both sides to eliminate it. On the left, we have to do a little bit of distribution. x minus 7 squared means we have to do x minus 7 multiplied by itself, so times another x minus 7. That's going to be equal to 39 minus 3x. I can now do some first outer inner last on that x minus 7. That gives me x squared minus 7x minus 7x is going to be minus 14x, and then plus 49. And that's going to be equal to 39 minus 3x. Now from here, I see that value of x squared show up. That's again a prime time indicator that we need to factor. But before we factor, let's set equal to 0 by subtracting 39 over to here. And let's add 3x over to here. That gives me now x squared minus 11x. And this is what? Plus 10 is equal to 0. We can now break that down into two binomials. We need x and x to multiply to x squared. I need a, let's see, two of the same signs if we're multiplying to a positive number at the end. And since there's a negative number in the middle, it makes sense to do minus, minus. And now we're looking for factors of 10 that will combine when I distribute to be this negative 11 here. That's going to be minus 1 and minus 10. Okay. So that gives us two potential solutions here of x is equal to 1 and x is equal to 10. Again, I say potential solutions this time. I correctly say potential solutions because we do need to t uh, check for extraneous solutions in a problem like this. All right. So I know we're just about at the end, but I'm just going to check for extraneous solutions and then we can be on our way. So uh, let's check first when x is equal to 1. Is it true, going way back up to the top to plug in, that 1 is equal to 7 plus the square root of 39 minus 3 times 1? Is that true? Oh boy, Ugh. I, I'm not. Uh, this is not off to a good start. 1 is equal to 7 plus the square root of 36. Is 1 equal to 13? Oh gosh, not even close. Not even close. This is like extraneous by a long shot. Okay, but, but, let's not get down on ourselves. There is still hope for x equals 10. Let's check when x is equal to 10. Very easy to get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Is it true that 10 is equal to 7 plus the square root? of 39 minus 3 times 10 is 10 equal to 7 plus the square root of this is 39 minus 30 so square root of 9 I like this one a lot better this is 10 is equal to 7 plus 3 which is clearly true so this problem does have one real solution of x is equal to 10 and one extraneous solution of x is equal to 1 okay does anyone have any questions as to how I solved a problem like that or any of the word problems that I've done today or any other word problems from the homework
Going once, everybody's thinking, everybody's processing. Going twice, everybody's still processing, still thinking. All right, gone three times. Sold to the highest bidder of nobody. So uh, that being said, that's all I have for you guys today. Keep in mind, again, the expectation is that you have those last three or those last five word problems done, problems six through ten for next class. That art is going to be on April 7th. So I will see you on April 7th for a discussion of those word problems as well as a review of what we've been talking about. After that class, I'll assign a progress assessment. It will be due the following class. We'll take some time to review. We'll have our summative on the 15th. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention and focus today. I appreciate that. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. And uh, feel free to reach out. Again, if you have any questions or concerns, make sure you do the attendance on Google Classroom. And that's all I got for you today. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. And have a great weekend because I won't see you before then. Hey, everyone. See you later. Mm -hmm.